Thanks, Betty. It's really great to be here. And, and let me just, so we understand each other. If I speak loudly, then I don't need to speak in the mic, correct? I mean, there's no, this isn't key, taped into, tied into anything. Okay, good. Because I may rove a little bit from the podium in the course of this time. So, hey, thanks again for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm Sydney Langer, as you just heard, from the Office of Research and Analysis. Um, so today, uh, flying in here uh, from, from Washington, um, I was stopped right before, uh, you know, usually go through security, through the, through the portal. And they, the guy just told me, the TSA guy told me, uh, you know, just put your, put your bags on there. You don't need to take off your belt, your shoes, nothing. And he said in a very cons conspiratorial way, like he goes, you know, just take off, you know, just, you don't have to take off uh, the usual stuff. So I'm like, what, is this a special deal? Like, what's going on? And I was thinking, I don't think I belong to the frequent flyer club that I'm, any, that I'm aware of, but I'm sure I burned up, racked up some points. Then I thought they must, then, then I got out to the other end and they, they uh, the, another security person told me, well, actually, this is a sample. We're doing a study, and this is just a, a sample, and you're, you're in the random sample. And I suddenly thought, so they picked me, and they must have known there must be some karma to the research directorship role. Um, so anyway, uh, this is kind of uh, both Jennifer and, and Betty. Have really, it's going to be great to talk with Jennifer. Uh, we have a lot of research, as you see, in common. Uh, but Betty has given me a lot, a generous amount of time with you and also has given me a lot of latitude in what I cover, but I wanted to uh, really try to use the balance of the time for the, the discussion, the back and forth. Uh, that said, I am going to boldly try to meld or synthesize three different uh, strands of research under this heading, which is essentially, uh, I call it variations on a theme, uh, and the theme being a sort of expansionist, if you will, uh, view, or let's say expansionists imply some kind of imperial conquest. I don't quite mean to imply that, but some kind of far-ranging, uh, some would say more holistic, more comprehensive view of arts and culture in our society and what we measure when we measure arts and aspects of arts and culture. And this theme, as you heard in the last eight years at the NEA, there's been a lot of research activity, and a lot of it has really, in various ways, tried to complete a mosaic of understanding uh, how can, how can we, how can we uh, measure something that we all can kind of relate to as Americans in, with respect to arts and culture, whether it's units of uh, analysis pertaining to arts and cultural infrastructure, to understanding arts and cultural uh, impacts on individuals and communities, and of course a lot of or, um, kind of interstitial area. Like what do, we, what do we talk about when we talk about arts and culture and measurement? And essentially, these three strands, each in their way, I would argue, really try to um, advance our understanding collectively. And it certainly provoked a lot of us at the NEA to think differently about how we define arts and culture, what we consider worth, worthy, uh, sort of part of our mantle as you know, cultural, arts and cultural uh, government officials. So um, the three strands, as you'll see, really come out of this. Um, let me make sure I can click this correctly. Uh, Okay, there you go. So this is really the system map, which you know, sort of a fancy kind of logic model for understanding how we view arts and cultural uh, um, sort of, let's call them clusters. Um, each of those boxes, and I don't. Ex some of you in the back may not may not be able to read it all, so you don't don't worry. You don't need to because I'm not going to go into it in great detail. But just to understand that this. Uh, map or model really evolved from a lot of conversations, discussions, literature reviews, and um, workshops where we really tried to come up with a way for understanding what's the, if, you, if, we, if we at the NEA had to develop a research agenda, what, what could we kind of hang it on as a scaffolding in a sense? Uh, what, um, what are some guiding domains that would generate research questions that we thought worth pursuing as a whole? Uh, for, the, for the nation and specifically for arts organizations and for arts practitioners and researchers. And, um, you know, as you can see, it, the, there's this yellow matter in the middle, which is essentially the sun of this universe, which is essentially arts participation, arts creation. Uh, we really, that's in, in essence the core of a lot of what we tend to measure and study as researchers. Um, but, you know, as you can see, there's a very complex kind of relationship, but I think somewhat sim simple, arguably, hopefully not simplistic, uh, relationship that's set up by these various, these variables. Uh, so if you look at it, um, what's outside the system is the human impulse to create and express. Essentially, um, 
we just, you know, there's almost like a first cause or, you know, the, the God particle, if you will, of, of arts research that we don't really probe too much. Rather, we tend to focus more on that map in the middle, um, the relationship of arts participation to these other constructs, the construct itself of arts participation, and just to highlight two uh, potential areas of impact, you'll see those two nodes over there. This is where I kind of move away. It is uh, benefit to individuals and community, individuals and benefit to communities. And of course, there are a variety of ways to think about how the arts relates to individual and community benefits. But we tend to focus on in our research going forward cognitive and emotional and health related outcomes related to individuals on the one hand, and on the other hand, social uh, and civic engagement, social cohesion, uh, livability, which also relates to some economic outputs and outcomes. And then also we, we posit that there's a kind of secondary effect, if you will, and this is again coming from largely theory-driven work, so it's not something we can prove or we even are attempting to prove necessarily, but to some extent really try, guides our work, is this understanding of these direct impacts of arts participation somehow generate the second order effect of societal capacities to innovate and express ideas. So um, you might think about whole new f forms of creativity and expression through art and media actually uh, coming out of the very process of engaging people in the arts. Um, so for example, um, you know, even to some extent the powers of freedom of expression and the degree to which we reinforce freedom of expression through artistic uh, participation um, is, is another second order outcome that we, uh, we hope to study. And all this kind of feeds back into uh, sort of the inputs of this ecosystem, arts infrastructure and education and training. So obviously we care about things like, uh, as some of you know, one of my former colleagues, Joanna uh, Bronkovich, has done a study on uh, buildings and facilities and arts and uh, capital, uh, capital structures uh, in the arts. That's something that's important for us to study and understand. We also relegate it, if you will, to a domain of, of inquiry that has its own literature. Um, but we also try to understand how it relates to these other areas. And I know I'm kind of, I could go on a lot about this, you probably don't want to hear me too much on this, but there's a report that we really try to dissect this model and talk about what kinds of measurement variables we would look at if we were creating a database, sort of an ideal platonic database to capture this kind of information and how the, the variables would relate to each other. But all you need to know really, and the only reason I even bother bringing this up is, for years, I think, even before this, uh, the NEA has been a really solid federal statistical agency collecting data about how people engage in various ways with the arts. Uh, they do this through the US Census Bureau, they do this through um, special studies. Um, how do Americans uh, sort of create art in terms of artists in the workforce, for example, which is one area of, of that domain. Um, but you know, there was really no organizing principle other than let's just go out and try to collect data. You know, I mean, there was really, I'm not trying to um, run down any kind of pre, pre, you know, previous regimes, if you will, of the NEA. It's just it's a fact that there wasn't a sort of central argument bolstering this data collection. It tended to be uh, fairly opportunistic, and that was good for the, hopefully for the people and for the agency. But now we are trying to be much more conservative, uh, concerted in thinking through these research questions and then looking for data to kind of help us solve that question. And that, that, that shift um, may be somewhat subtle, but it actually does guide everything we do now. So we have a grants program, for example, a research grants program, which you heard about, of which we're now in the third year. And um, it's, it's really been exciting to watch because we've thrown this model out there and said, hey, look, we don't think this is uh, canon or anything sacred. You know, we want you to tear it down if you want, but do think of it as a construct to help guide your research questions and the kinds of things we're interested in knowing as an agency about how uh, the arts, uh, what the value and the impact of the arts is. And that's embedded in our strategic plan as an agency. Uh, to really promote understanding and knowledge about the, uh, the contributions of the arts to individuals and communities. So that's a lot of sort of lengthy prelude. Um, I want to just talk about th these three strands I talked about, I mentioned that I'd be dis uh, discussing with you. Uh, you can think about this in, sort of in relation to the model, but you don't need to be shackled to it. Um, the three things I want to talk about is uh, data systems and efforts to collect information and report uh, findings about the arts relative to civic and cultural engagement as a whole, um, relationship of the arts to human development broadly, um, whether you're talking about sort of educational or health-related outcomes, 
Um, and then thirdly, economic growth and economic development, which is another area that we have increasingly, I think, to good effect, brought data to service uh, an understanding of how the arts contribute to innovation and some of those second order benefits you've heard me talk about. So, um, so some of you may not know this. When, when you say that there was some mention of the arts in the president's budget, you may think, oh, you mean the budget submission that he's, you know, what he submitted to Congress, that was, you know, written up everywhere, and are you talking about the appropriations money for the Indian? No, I'm actually talking about a fairly, I would argue, not very closely read piece that actually is in a document called Analytical Perspective. So you can tell I'm coming from Washington, D.C., right? But this is part of a multi-volume set of the budget where when the president sends it to Capitol Hill and it goes to all the federal agencies and so forth and to the public. Um, and there's a section there um, called Social Indicators, where OMB, the Office of Management and Budget in the White House, went around corralling data about, um, to serve as indicators for how this country is doing in a variety of ways. So there's stuff in there about crime rates, stuff about education, all kinds of things. Fairly negative things, actually, for the most part. But then you suddenly see uh, an a whole section uh, called Civic and Cultural Engagement partly because of the work we did with OMB. Um, and you see two indicators there, uh, one that they chose to report, to kind of report to the public sort of the state of the, almost like analogous to the State of the Union, you know, here's the state of cultural participation in a nutshell, and two bullets, which we can debate. One is the percent who attended arts events, they threw in movies into the mix, and they got 64% uh, of Americans, close to 64% in 2012, <coughs> And then they go back in time and they show in 1982 that number was about 72%. Then they talk about leisure reading, which is a broad category of uh, books or uh, various kinds of literature, poems, short stories, novels, plays. And they said in 1982 it was 66%. Now it's down to 58%. Now this is just wedged in a chart with a lot of other data. But they did actually go through the trouble to write a little gloss on the finding, which I think some of you will appreciate. It says, however, so they, so they talk about the declines and then they say, however, new modes of cultural engagement have emerged, such as consumption of art via the internet and handheld devices. That's all they say, but you know, that's, that's pretty sophisticated, you know, when you talk about the budget and you know, the arts. I mean, that's, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't expect much more than that. I think I just had your water. Okay, so, but that said, I mean, where does this come from? This is coming from the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts as you may have guessed, which is the NEA survey that's been done since 1982 uh, with the U.S. Census Bureau. And um, I, what I like about it is, okay, so this is an effort to actually embed that data in some kind of policy uh, deliberation. And now you can argue this is very kind of high level, it's not making any specific policy recommendations, yet this is a framework that is the social indicators that is meant to sort of be a kind of uh, status update on various things that we should care about as a society. And um, I, you know, I do feel good that it's got a place there. Um, and we can, we can debate, and, you know, what ele and I'm hoping this will yield some discussion as to what elements of engagement really matter and are those the right ways to report it, for example. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna talk first about this whole uh, cultural participation element. Um, I just sort of told you about the SPPA, uh, so I don't need to hopefully tell you too much more about the, um, the framework of it. Um, although you should note, I think someone said, uh, maybe it was uh, maybe Betty in public, or I know Jennifer and I were talking about this, this is the first time when we doubled the sample size and we reached about 37,000 adults. Uh, it's you know, obviously nationally representative, it's done with this U.S. Census Bureau, which generally has very high response rates, so we feel pretty good about the representative nature of the people, of the response, the responses. Hopefully we ask the right questions, that's key. So, um, this is, these are just some publications that we've, uh, examples of publications we've put out in the past. We have a lot of reports on our website at arts.gov. Uh, one of those is actually written, co-written by Jennifer here with Alan Brown. Um, and I think it was a very interesting report on, um, actually, no, we didn't, we didn't show the cover on this one. Sorry, <laughs> must have done that on purpose. But anyway, it's about multiple modes of participation. And one of the things you'll learn very quickly is a lot of focus historically has been placed on attendance. Um, and we, not only are we trying to understand how do we capture that data better, but what other kinds of uh, modes are there and how do we kind of put a framework around it that really truly speaks to what we all mean when we say cultural participation, assuming there's some 
ability to get consensus on that. Okay, so um, this is the cover of the summary uh, sort of highlights report we released last year, uh, which is again available on our website. I'm gonna really just go through maybe a few findings, not really an extensive overview as I've done in other presentations, um, and maybe just kind of highlight a couple of things that we're now seeing because we're doing a more comprehensive report. I think it's gonna be about 118 something pages, a lot of tables, charts, and uh, text, um, really going through the survey in detail. So there are five modes, uh, which I think some of Jennifer's thinking really informed this, and certainly a lot of the conversations we've had with the field and the way we constructed the survey. Um, in 2012, for that survey, we decided to really overhaul some elements of the previous surveys to get at different types of participation. Uh, so for example, that number that you saw, that um, you know, the 70, I forgot the number now, 60 something percent of adults who did any kind of art form, it's, it's that approach to try to bring together different kinds of attendance, uh, but also look at other different uh, modes. So for example, there, there are five distinct modes uh, that we, we tend to focus on. One is arts attendance, and that can be visual arts, which we get into separately versus performing arts. There are all kinds of hybrid attendance activities like festivals, fairs. There's also movies, which we deal with separately, but for all intents and purposes, one could consider it as a form of general attendance. Uh, there's, some, there's obvious complications when you talk about live. That never used to be a problem. For years, it's been, did you attend a live arts you know, experience, or however the question is phrased. Um, but of course, we know about things like HD streaming of operas, and you know, sometimes it's live, sometimes it's not. There are many other problematic issues with that, which we haven't resolved successfully, I have to say. Nevertheless, we, I think, are getting closer through some of the stuff in the survey. Reading books and literature, we care about that, whether it's done online or in the actual hard copies. Um, Arts consumption through electronic media. And what do we mean by that? We mean like TV, radio, old hardware, you know, my eight tracks, I guess. But we also care about, you know, of course, uh, various forms of you know, electronic media through the internet, digital media, handheld devices. And um, we also care about art making and sharing of art. Now, you could arguably split those things, but we're trying to here consider it as one whole. And there, you know, too, involves a lot of technology. So to, work, to the extent we can tease out the degree to which um, electronic media is used to create or share versus analog, we, well, we're interested in doing that. But the primary thing there is, is the actual activity of creating or sharing or performing art. Arts learning, uh, learning in art, whether in school or out of school. So um, in these five modes, I'll just touch on them. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, we did this year, which is quite different from the way we've reported the data in the past. Uh, we basically aggregated various forms of visual arts attendance and various forms of performing arts attendance. And we looked at movies. And as you see here, uh, you know, movies is clearly, you know, more, more Americans attended movies than these other things. And in fact, what's interesting is this year it was actually a rise over the 2008 levels. One of the few things in the survey that jumped uh, when you looked at trend data. Um, but, you know, visual arts, uh, and I'll get into the trend data in a moment, but just for a snapshot, about 39% went to some kind of visual arts uh, activity, you know, museum, gallery, or uh, visual arts fair or festival. Um, and uh, performing arts, you had about 37%. Now, here's where it gets interesting, I think, generally speaking. Uh, the thing about this survey, of course, is it allows us to track over time how often people engaged in things and what kinds of activities. Uh, because of some of the new questions that we added, I won't be getting into some of the, those kinds of arts activities. Rather, I'm going to focus here for a moment on some selected what are called benchmark arts activities, not because we believe there's an inherent value uh, to those activities that's superior to other arts activities, but rather because it's a cluster of activities that's meant to generally represent what this agency has been tracking for years when it comes to arts and cultural attendance. And those things are classical music, attendance at classical music, attendance at plays, musicals, non-musicals. Uh, can people hear me okay? Okay, attendance at um, opera, attendance at ballet, uh, but also um, attendance uh, to you know, visiting art museums or galleries. So this is the kind of the sad news, and this is what we tended to get always kind of rolling out in terms of the stuff the NEA you know, has been focusing on with the news, is that since 82, there's been a decline, despite the spike in 92, uh, in the number of people, the share of adults who did any of those activities. And this is an adult survey, I should say, all adults, 18 and above. And now we're down to about a third versus at one point, as you see, 
So that's something that tends to be frowned upon, and you know, that's something that people are genuinely concerned about in some places. The previous ch ch chairman, right now we have an acting chairman, uh, Joan Shigakawa, but Rocco Landisman uh, pounced on this data, and actually even back using the 2008 data, as you can see there was a decline even then, um, and used it to galvanize kind of discussion about supply and demand in the arts. And people have used this, these data for purposes of understanding the ratio of supply and demand. Like, is this, does this decline reflect an interest in people going? Does it reflect, uh, you know, the diminution of resources? What are we talking about? Um, and, and actually, I won't go into every single art form, but one of the things that is, is kind of interesting is that musical plays, for the first time, we saw a decline. Uh, previously, it pretty much held flat. Uh, and non-musical plays, this is another, I think the third or fourth consecutive period in which we've seen a decline in attendance. So it's steadily declining in terms of attendance, share of adults who attended any uh, non-musical play, according to the survey. Visual arts, unfortunately, we saw a similar kind of uh, pattern. Uh, art museums and galleries actually held, you know, it was relatively stable since the last time, but there have been declines in previous years. And craft fairs or visual art festivals, we saw a decline. Um, I'm only focusing on the bad news up front because I have another point to make. But not to say that you shouldn't, you know, that this is invaluable in of itself. Of course it is. But the preview of the full report. So the full report actually gets into this, but then we also, rather than just make the focal point of comparison 2008, which is the last survey, uh, to 2012, which is the one that just came out, we're looking at um, that whole decade. So we're looking at 2002, and we're seeing is the decline from 08 to 12, how significant is that relative to what we've been seeing? And it turns out that when you look at these different art forms, uh, dance, other than ballet, so we actually have a question where we ask about ballet, because we've been doing that historically, but then we ask about, did you go to a dance not, that wasn't ballet? And that's the only art form where we haven't seen a decline in this whole decade, it's interesting. Um, we also saw that African Americans generally did not reduce participation at all over that whole period. Um, in any of these arts attendance forms. And in fact, what we did see was an increase among 75 years of age, people 75 years of age and older. And we saw that from 2002 to 2012. We also saw it from 2008 to 2012. Um, and that's pretty interesting. I mean, some of this we would say, well, of course, yes, these people were going in previous years and they counted for the population that was going at a higher rate. But, you know, I think this wasn't necessarily something foreseeable. A lot of people have wondered, will you see this, this generation group continue to attend? And they seem to be doing so. And part of it also have, may have to do with health and mobility benefits and the fact that they can get around and go in places and that they're, you know, they're, have, they're, they're living longer, frankly, and things like that. But that's actually something that is, I guess, um, a positive takeaway about the engagement, levels of engagement among this particular group. Um, another thing that we found with the attendance that will be in the full report is when you control for the demographic shifts, um, you find that um, there's an argument to be made that's really the changing demographic that's largely responsible for the declines in this manner. Um, older adults, of course, a larger share of the general population than they were several years ago. Um, also, non-white racial ethnic groups are a bigger population, particularly Hispanics. And those two groups have tended historically to have lower levels of attendance. So, for example, even though older adults are going, are, it's going up, it's still a relatively low share of, the, of that group that's going to arts events. Um, so that may have caused, so when we control for those factors, we actually think that dem the drug demographic shifts are largely responsible, though we can't rule out things like why, you know, individual preferences and tastes and, of course, all these other great things. But the survey, at least, at least from the data it collects, we can you know, we can control for various factors, and it seems to be that demographic shifts are really driving this. Um, reading books and literature, um, a similar kind of thing where we saw a decline uh, from 08 to 2012, but relatively flat since 2002, which itself was a decline. Um, book reading, uh, it's a little more flat. It's not quite so uh, up and down. Um, one thing I will draw your attention to, perhaps because we're in Chicago, and this is where the Poetry Foundation, for example, is. <coughs> Harriet Monroe founded her magazine. Uh, poetry is actually doing, unfortunately, um, let's say doing the worst according to the survey. Um, you know, on the other literary forms, there's been a kind of you know up and down factor. But with poetry, it's been a steady decline. They've lost about half of the share of their readership according to the survey uh, since two, two, 2002. Um, 
And I think, you know, that's significant, uh, very significant, and uh, something that, you know, sometimes gets buried in the mix with all the other data. So uh, consumption through electronic media, uh, reading, of course, is one of those things, but I've kind of left that out of this for the purpose of this discussion. Um, so what do we mean by handheld, what, what do we mean by electronic media? Well, of course, there's TV or radio, and by the way, all this stuff blurs very rapidly. You know that we all watch TV on our laptops sometimes. You know, you do, you do, you know, you, you, there are various ways you can uh, merge, mix, and match these art forms, I mean, these genres, these uh, media forms. But um, TV or radio, handheld or mobile devices, internet, and, you know, kind of DVD, CD, tape player, record player. And I want to just clarify that the, the questions are set up so that the respondent is inclined to think of those as discrete art, discrete media. So even though I just said you can watch, uh, a program on Hulu, you know, through the internet. The way that we believe that the way the questions were worded, it was they would be literally thinking of a TV set. If that makes sense because we had a category listing the kinds of things we were interested in. Um, so TV or radio um, is clearly the lead still in terms of the, way, the share of people who engage in art and whether it's visual arts or performing arts. Um, handheld mobile devices, internet, uh, DVD. You, you can see the numbers for yourselves. But basically, the point is that more than two-thirds of adults uh, engage with the arts through one of these methods. Um, with handheld mobile devices alone, uh, it turns out, and no surprise perhaps, music really is leading the pack in terms of the art forms that people engage with uh, through that, that media. Uh, literature comes next, uh, followed by visual arts. And what was interesting here is that although we don't have trend data with these, with these questions, because this is really a lot of times the questions about media kind of change with the survey because so much has been kind of invented in the last go around and we're trying to get a handle in fact on standardizing those questions. Nevertheless, um, this is a key point that no single racial or ethnic group is more likely than another to use these media to engage in these art forms. Now to be sure, uh, there are discrepancies by race and ethnicity in the access to mobile devices and handheld devices for example, but once they own it, if they have access to those devices, we're not seeing a big, the levels are about the same with music and um, visual art and dance and theater. So I thought that was quite interesting relative to some of the other findings where you see often big discrepancies uh, based on race or ethnic group uh, participation in say certain kinds of attendance. So five modes, uh, art making, art sharing. And this has got a lot of different interesting questions which are brand new to the survey. Uh, but one of the ones that actually might have come out of this this building, because I was, I was presenting on the 2008 survey, and I remember somebody said, how come you don't ask about um, social dancing, given, you know, so you think you can dance, which was really hot then, I don't know, is it still popular now, I don't follow these things, but, you know, they were asking about, you know, those programs, like, what's a spillover, and are people going out and dancing? I, I can't credit this building for that, but I, I think this was definitely a place where that question was raised. So we actually took that back to the survey, and uh, it turns out that of all the art, performance, creation types of activities you can do, it was, it was by far the, the most popular. Uh, a third of adults uh, said they danced at a wedding, a club, or other social setting. Um, Hispanic Americans had the highest rates of any group social dancing, and they accounted for about 18% of all social dancers. Um, and it's interesting, 40% of the 18 to 34 crowd were represented in that group, and they accounted, and um, and there were 40% of them actually uh, of that group actually did this activity. So it was really quite interesting, and it shed light on something. Uh, of course, it was mocked a little genially uh, in a PBS piece. <laughs> how how doing the hus hustle of your of your cousin's wedding is art. Actually, the piece was very sympathetic. It was just the the headline. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and I, I won't go into it here, but we did track a lot of things. Just so you know, photography, um, playing a musical instrument, these were some, and weaving, crocheting, quilting, and fiber arts were definitely in the lead in terms of the larger share of people who did those art forms. Now, arts learning. Um, I don't know, is Nick Rabkin here? He's not here. Is he? Okay, well, Nick Rabkin worked with us on a report um, when the 2008 study came out. Uh, Nick Rabkin from Newark. And uh, one of the things he pointed out in his report was that there had been a systematically, there had been a decline in the share of adults who reported um, having a class or lesson in a particular art form over the years. And, you know, he, he actually goes into great length in the report talking about um, the, what factors may be at play, the provision of arts education in the schools, 
um, demographics, uh, schisms, you know, in terms of age groups and uh, particular, sorry, racial ethnic groups and education levels, people not having access to these, to these uh, services. Uh, but, you know, one of the things he did say in his report is, you know, the problem is the survey is great, but it's kind of moved the yard, moved the, uh, the goalposts in some years. So we've never really had a consistent measure of this. Some years we ask about, in, we always ask about classes or lessons, that's our consistent factor. But we also only ask about in school versus out of school. We've done various things over the years. So this really helped us in revising the survey and finding a way to track with the previous years but still kind of innovate within the survey. So um, actually I should say, so before I go to that, if you ask, did you take an arts class or lesson, you get one number. But then when you ask, did you did you ever in your life, did you, in your lifetime, have you ever um, learned through, taught yourself something, like taught yourself how to play a musical instrument, or learned through a family tradition, which in some cultural specific groups, you know, that's very uh, popular, um, or you learned on the internet, you know, you ask about all kinds of ways people can learn. It's actually 56% of adults at this time, a snapshot, have had some kind of arts education in their lives. We don't know about the quality of the education, we don't know about the duration, but we know about the art forms. So when you ask about like, whether in their whole lifetime they've taken a class or lesson, you have adults of all ages, um, it's 50%. Um, and 43% said they took a class or lesson in childhood, and 7% did so, um, uh, sorry, in, oh yeah, in 2012 alone. Now for the full report, a couple of points uh, that I think are really interesting, and, and I don't quite know what to make of this. After Nick's really nice narrative, I mean, sad but true kind of narrative of the declines. We suddenly saw that in 2000, when we look at track this decade, 2002 to 2012, we actually see an increase in 18 and 24 year olds taking arts classes in the last year. Now, this is interesting from a variety of perspectives, or sorry, any time in their lives. That's interesting from a variety of perspectives. For one, for one thing, if you ask the average American, what do you, you know, in the whole course, course of your life, have you done this or that or the other, you just hope that they have good memories, right? 18 to 24-year-olds, it's not necessarily fail-proof, but you, you have a sense that they're going to remember their school year much more, that year much, they're much closer to it. So we actually have a little more reliability on that age group when we ask about arts education. And it turns out that there is this increase over this decade. Um, and then when you look at the adults as a whole, actually this is the first time we actually see an increase in the lifetime recall of arts education. Um, now remember, only 7% in the last year took an arts class or lesson, but when you ask about all these other, when you ask, sorry about, um, yeah, when you ask about the whole lifetime, sorry, let me back up. In the last year, 7% took an arts class or lesson, but when you ask them the whole lifetime, it was about 50%. And that's, that's higher, I don't know the number offhand, but it was a significant increase from the previous years. So this is something we're trying to understand a little more and what it means in terms of the ways people engage. And I will say something else, that because we asked about different art forms as well for the first time, again, making sure we can keep the results comparable so we can do comparisons, it was interesting that um, you know, certain things like dance or um, um, filmmaking, certainly, uh, photography, these were things that people did not take classes a lot of times for. So we learned that there are whole areas of the arts that are much more dynamic in the non-formal <coughs> setting. And that's something we see in the attendance data too, because I didn't show the slide, but we've actually asked about venues where people go to engage with arts, and they're much higher in places like you know, churches, schools, uh, even bars, restaurants, uh, you know, than they are if you ask sometimes full on about a specific art form. So this really raises a kind of conundrum from a researcher's standpoint. It's very interesting. But what does it mean? I mean, you have plurality of ways people engage with the arts. You have a plural, plural, uh, plurality of art forms, and you have a changing demographic and ch changing technology. Um, what are the sort of the takeaways for people on the ground? I'm hoping to hear your opinions as practitioners, as researchers, as to what really stands out to you and what would be useful in your own communities of practice. So um, lastly, on this piece about arts participation, I just want to say that a full report will be coming out soon. Uh, it will contain an analysis of state level and metro level area rates of participation, which, uh, which will be featured on an online component of the report. And we also did a contest or a challenge where we asked sort of crowdsourced interesting data visualization applications, apps, for this, uh, for, for using the survey. And we got a couple of uh, winners that we want to announce, and that will be kind of interesting to see what they've managed to do with our data. And I think they're actually really user friendly tools uh, to help people play with the data. And lastly, um, we're doing a, a research symposium 
uh, with our friends from the uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council of the UK, part of the research councils of the UK, who's also been grappling in similar ways to us as to how to make these studies more relevant and how do you extract information from the public in a changing landscape of data collection. So we're having a meeting uh, at the Gallup uh, building, the Gallup Foundation, uh, sorry, um, the Gallup Corporation uh, is hosting it um, in June and we're gonna webcast it. Uh, it'll probably be archived and soon after webcast for people um, where we're gonna go over these issues. So I'm gonna try to keep to the time and not go over. Um, so I know, just stick with me just a little bit. Um, arts and subjective be well-being. Uh, so if you're, just now I've been talking about sort of sheer behavioral patterns in terms of how often people go to things. I should add, we do have a study in the works about why people go to things and what keeps them from going to things, if you're talking about attendance, for example, and that's in the works. But I want to get to this thing about, I talked about human development and impact of participation on the individual. And we actually funded two grants that have done some exploratory work in this area. One was a grant to Carol Graham, who's a happiness researcher at the uh, Brookings Institution. He's done a lot of work in uh, developing countries on uh, metrics to capture what matters to people in their lives, sort of analogous or really meant to be kind of in conversation with GDP uh, when you look at hard economic outputs. Um, and they're looking at some of our data. They looked at our data and they tried to kind of do a, I think they would admit fairly early stages kind of analysis to find out what would happen if we overlaid some of our data on some Gallup's data which tracks this, and it's quite interesting. It has some promising areas for research. It's not fully, um, you know, clearly it's, it still needs work in terms of the work we all need to do in this area, but it shows that arts creators and arts consumers seem to rate relatively high compared to some other populations. Um, Vanderbilt University, Stephen Tepper is actually moving to Arizona State uh, University, I believe, is um, did, actually did, just did a report for us, I mean, as part of our grant, uh, we looked at analysis of creative practice and creative well-being using three national surveys. He didn't use the SPPA, but he used some other surveys to look at uh, the relationships you might posit between the arts and subjective well-being. They're very positive. Uh, so those are just two things I wanted to flag for you. Now, over time, we have a new grants program, I've said. Um, one thing I've watched, because you know, of course we love charts and tables, um, is that when, when you apply for a grant, you know, we've tried to class tax sort of um, categorize these applicants in ways that match a certain outcome. And it turns out that the share of grant applicants for research at the NEA over the last three years has grown when it comes to those who are focusing more on benefit of art to individuals. So when you come in for a grant for the NEA, for NEA research, you can study any phenomenon about the arts practically, as long as it's a well-written research grant. But for some reason, this particular domain that I showed you that chart of before is really picked up and attracted a lot of interest. So now more than 50% of successful applications we just awarded funding for uh, are now focusing on these benefits, health or educational outcomes to individuals. What do we mean by that? Um, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of them, but I wanna draw your attention to why I think this might be happening, partly because of a, a lot more visibility that I think the NEA has taken in promoting this whole concept of the arts and human development. Um, we've, we've done a lot of studies on this, uh, two in particular. One was with the National Academies of Sci Academy of Science where we worked with about three other, three NIH, National Institutes of Health entities to commission a study on, a workshop on the arts and aging. And we also did another white paper uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services on this issue. And this task force contains about um, 18 representatives from different federal agencies, departments, or divisions, and includes several NIH institutes, but also includes Department of Health and Human Services, uh, National Science Foundation, uh, Department of Education, and others. And what do we do? Um, this group actually meets quarterly. We host a public webinar series. Uh, I hope you all will check us out. Um, there's, a there's a website at the end of this presentation uh, explaining where you can find information about that. And um, we do have, we actually did, as I say, commission this workshop and five papers on the arts and aging. And the results of that, I'm very pleased to say, have led NIH to, to uh, they're in the process of drafting a funding opportunity for research on the arts and, um, and, and palliative care, actually. Um, so that's something we're really excited to have helped to facilitate. As well, um, also it turns out that uh, the National Institute on Aging has revised some of its guidelines for research applicants 
so that there's now mentions explicitly of arts therapy and arts interventions in an eligible area for study. So it is making some baby step approaches you know, within the government to try to uh, hopefully throw more uh, resources in this direction. Um, we also have contributed modules to two major studies funded by NIH, the National Children's Study and the Health and Retirement Study. So uh, you know, if you think about the lifelong element of this, of this uh, er subject matter, human development, we're, we're collecting data on early childhood exposure to the arts and various outcomes, and then on the other end, uh, with retired adults, we're looking at how they participate in the arts in a variety of ways, and what does that mean relative to other outcomes. Finally, um, we, well, I already mentioned the NIH grant opportunity. So these are just some things in the hopper. It's been a great kind of organizing vehicle for a lot of this work. I'm just going to touch base. How much time do I have? I'm gonna, okay, just, just two, two uh, grant, uh, grants in this area, then I'll move on to the economics part, that, and then that's it. Uh, there are two, uh, two grantees I wanted to highlight uh, that are very much in the space of arts and human development. We just announced an award to the University of New Mexico where they're actually uh, looking, they have a really interesting data source. Uh, they have um, basically MRI analyses, brain imaging analyses, uh, and psychometric tests related to 400 uh, adults, and I'm looking at Peter Lynette from New Mexico, <laughs> New Mexicans ages 16 to 14 who have shown a sustained interest in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. And the reason they've been collecting this sort of brain scan information and so forth is they want to understand how uh, the skill sets that are developed and fostered through science and engineering and technology might be fostering broader creativity. And this is something that's, that part of us being funded by the Templeton Foundation. Uh, we can, some, one of the researchers who was working on this project saw this grant opportunity of ours and said, you know, let's design a questionnaire related to music creativity. And let's try to understand those who have skills and inclination in music who are in this cohort and understand how they may contrast or compare with the broader pool of STEM uh, skills uh, that, are, that are shown. And so they're going to target correlations among musical experience, brain structure, and cognitive capacity. And we're really looking forward to those results. The second one I want to show you is Pennsylvania State University Hershey Medical Center, which is actually doing an interesting study, a uh, randomized, I believe, uh, controlled trial, where they're looking at cancer patients in their hospital settings. And they're comparing three forms of arts exposure. One where, well, actually, one is no arts exposure, where they're in hospital rooms with no visual art. Uh, there's one group that is, gets to select the visual art that's in there from a roster of available visual art that they, they have in the room. And then there's a, there's a group that actually doesn't have, um, sorry, that, that, that where the researchers select the art for them. And so there are these three groups that are following over, the time, over time. And this is really primarily related to um, the pain that these patients suffer in, in during and after chemotherapy and anxiety and use of pain meds and, and the general rates of satisfaction as a patient. And it's looking at that over time in, group, in all those three groups and trying to isolate the impact of the exposure therapy. So I'm going to move to this third topic, and I, I hope this isn't too unwieldy. I tried to kind of stick to my lanes. But now I'm talking about the arts and economic development, which is the third major strand here. Um, we have put out a couple of reports. Uh, one was uh, edited by Michael Rushton called Creative and Communities, which germinated from a, a meeting with the, at the Brookings Institution in DC on artworks and economic development, a series of papers. Uh, we've also done a study recently on industrial design and its contributions to the economy, <coughs> primarily, through, primarily through innovation. So if you remember that sort of org, org chart thing I showed you at the beginning, I talked about the second order outcomes. Well, it turns out that a lot of the innovation that goes on in design is directly, and sorry, a lot of the innovations that go on in the patent community for utility patents is, comes out of the design community. So there's a really a secondary level, if you will, actually could be argued direct impact on, uh, on the nation's economy through industrial design that we really wanted to examine. So that's an interesting report. Uh, but what really, I think, has kind of given us a, um, a real purchase on this topic, economical pun intended, awful pun, is uh, we, we released this arts and cultural production satellite account, uh, which is essentially a new product that's being generated by the Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, in, sponsor, in cooperation with the NEA. 
And the, NE, the BEA, for those of you who don't know, is, is they're the people who, really the nation's accountants, they're the ones who tally up every quarter how the GDP is doing, how various industries are doing. <coughs> and we've always known how various industries are doing, but we never really got a fine read on arts and cultural industries. So we went to them and we said, you know, we'd really like to do this, and they were very sympathetic, it turns out, because this was coming at a time when BEA has been trying to put its hands on what are called intangible assets. Uh, so, for example, how do you account for the value of R&D, of software, of various uh, goods and services that tend to get written off? So they were actually, it was coming at a time when they themselves had realized we need to capture the long-lived value of arts and cultural products. So it actually dovetailed very nicely, and um, when it was done, it turns out that I heard that Secretary Pritzker from the U.S. Department of Commerce actually um, helped to write, actually wanted to write the statement which appeared in the press release. The positive value of arts and culture on society has been understood on a human level for millennia. With this new effort, we are now able to quantify the impact of arts and culture on GDP for the very first time. The reason I love this statement so much is because it, in two sentences it brings the fact that what we think we know already, what's apparent, and therefore may arguably not need measuring as we know this stuff matters, you know, the first sentence. But the second sentence is, that said, we see this as an important dimension of measuring that. And I think that's what we always try to say about this stuff is we're not claiming that arts and cultural, the economic value is the only thing worth measuring, but it is definitely a benefit worth tracking. So um, this is the big number really, that when we look at all the industries related to arts and culture, they account for three to five percent, three percent, more than three percent of the US GDP, it's about half a trillion dollars. And you may wonder what does that mean in real terms? Well, when you look at that in comparison with many other industries, uh, you actually see that you know, there's some that are clearly ahead of arts and culture, retail trade as a whole, construction. But, you know, there are also some that are just behind it. Uh, transportation, you know, the arts and cultural industries are bigger than, you know, mining, agriculture. There are others that are not on here. What do we mean by GDP? Uh, GDP, gross domestic product, is really the final kind of economic value uh, measure, measurement. It's, it's, you know, the, the combination of all the economic output of all the goods and services in this country. Uh, when you back out of it, intermediate costs, so supply costs and so forth. So uh, what we're capturing here is the added value of the arts. What does the arts actually contribute to the GDP? And that number really sparked a lot of articles. There was a Bloomberg uh, news piece as well and, and several things. They all latched onto the one number, which I you know, find a little amusing because there's actually a lot of really great data that this unleashed that wasn't probably written about at the time. What we got from the BEA was a time series of data from 1998 through 2011, and they're going to update it next year as well. And they also um, gave us a lot of other information. I mean, they gave us like, you know, the number of employees uh, in, employed by these, you know, these industries, uh, you know, the economic output, the revenues, expenditures in the cases of nonprofits, uh, and really granular information that we can you know, look into. Um, and who are the top contributors of that 500 billion? You have to remember, of course, this is for and nonprofit. Um, so you see the motion pictures, videos are up the top, video industry. Advertising, what's interesting about advertising is we didn't include all of advertising. One of the things BEA lets you do is they'll pull out the components of advertising that are agreed upon to be creative. So what do we include there? Well, there's, it was well understood that advertising campaigns, graphic design related to advertising, those kinds of things were pulled out, not the guy who puts a you know, flyer on your windshield, for example. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Cable, television, production, and distribution, uh, TV and radio, uh, um, sorry, uh, broadcasting, uh, you know, of course, publishing. Uh, and, and, you know, this is actually very respectable when you're just ranking, you know, looking at all the industries. The Performing Arts and Independent Artists Group, which includes uh, artists who are not belonging to a specific uh, institution, as well as uh, performing arts in its totality, uh, is still a leading contributor to that GDP growth. Um, and just so you know, historically, uh, you know, we feel that that's great, you know, 3.25%, uh, but you know, that's actually, there was, of course, the recession from which we're still crawling out. And you can see that at one point it was quite even higher, um, over 3.7%. So you know, there's a lot of potential here, I feel, in, 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 uh, and we all feel for what, you know, what share of the GDP of the arts can actually account for. When you look at gross output, here we're just talking about sheer revenue for the most part, except for expenses when we talk about nonprofits. Uh, again, you may not be able to read this, but I want to highlight that one of the key drivers is arts education. 
Um, that was actually pretty significant. It, we didn't expect that at all. Um, and that is, it, we actually did an article, the, uh, the head of, uh, the division director for arts education and the NEA and I wrote a piece for the Chronicle of Higher Education just pulling that out for people because we thought that was really interesting. When you look at the workers that are employed by the industries as well as the compensation for those workers, it's about two million, close to two million, but um, the bad news is uh, that share was much higher um, in previous years. Um, in fact, in, uh, I think in 2000 or so, it was about uh, 2.5 2, 2 million. So you know, partly because of the recession, there's been a decline there. And lastly, this is something, again, was not expected, is that we are actually seeing a trade surplus with arts and cultural industries. Uh, they're actually expo we're exporting 10.4 billion more than we're importing in the sector, and that's of interest to a lot of industries and I mean a lot of people, financial analysts tracking these fields. Um, why is that the case? Um, well, partly because um, well, what's interesting is if you see over time uh, this blue line there at the bottom is the share of exports and art, arts and cultural goods. It's been steadily climbing um, relative to imports, and in fact. Um, the dip, the recession recently was associated, I think, with a lot of drop in consumption. So with that went a lot of reduction of imports, but that exporting still went on, you know, still continued. So that's what's accounting for the surplus. But it was interesting for people to, to get their hands on that and we recognize here's a growth industry. These are growth industries when it comes to uh, trade. <coughs> trade. Um, we have a place on our website I'm going to highlight for you. We have several of these kinds of web pages related to specific data sets. This one mines the arts and cultural project satellite account, uh, sorry, production satellite account I was just telling you about. And on the right we have, you can scroll down and get to brief, issue briefs, uh, sort of like, you know, a, a paper that was written by one of my analysts, Bonnie Nichols, on how we did this relative to other countries. Uh, really some great information we hope will continue to be publicly disseminated. And finally, uh, I wanted to point out that we have, I talked about our research grants program. We actually have three grants that, since our program started a few years ago, that are either active or just completed here. One is the University of Illinois Chicago, uh, one is the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and one is the University of Chicago's Cultural Policy Center. I'll leave you two to duke it out who's the PI. I think I put Betty Farrell. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if you want to know more about these grants, you can certainly learn from our website. We have an online searchable database. And here's some context. I'll just leave this up here if people are interested uh, in the course of the discussion. I know Jennifer's going to be next, but maybe we can go back to that. All right? Thank you. So basically, my role here is to talk about how is all of this relevant to Chicago. I actually help you. Sorry, I'm the Mac. But I'm actually going to try to. How is all of this work relevant to Chicago? And I'm going to try to do that, speak about that in two ways. One is just to offer you a commentary, um, and then second to actually show you some of this data and how it connects to Chicago. So with my commentary is that basically, increasingly, we are in a data-driven society. For whatever mix of reasons you can identify as to why that is, accountability movements, technology and accessibility and access and being able to collect that, manage it, process it, use it, visualize it, evolving notions about what art and cultural entities and activities are that evolve, whatever the reasons are, the sea change is upon us, we're in it, we're moving forward. And arts organizations and those involved in the arts are increasingly called upon to make their arguments in a more sophisticated manner. And I'm not saying sophisticated in being in improved cherry picking about what data you use or what numbers you use, but to really use data in whatever form it may be in a much more rigorous and transparent manner. And that's policy makers, that is small arts organizations, that's funders, but everyone's being called to do this. And so there are a lot of conversations underway currently that all, sp that all speak to this. This is not just, just the Cultural Policy Center, although we're involved in those conversations. But there are really big questions being fostered in the field about data literacy, ability to manipulate and to utilize data, translate it, how are arts administrators trained, their ability to work with data, utilize it, apply it, um, really pragmatic, how, pragmatically, how do we help arts organizations utilize data? What can be expected of them versus what might they go, what special, specialty should they have in-house versus out-of-house? 
What questions should they be asked? How can existing academic research better be translated and communicated and utilized in a practitioner field so we're not replicating um, knowledge or replicating endeavors? How can all of that be actually applied to decision making? Um, and then there's a lot of data out there. I think the conversation in the data field for a long time has been about deficit. But there's a lot of data out there. Certainly we all have questions about what else can be collected or what collection methodologies can be improved. But, and then also about, we don't want too much because then there's a questions about what data is relevant and how do we want to prioritize that. So all these questions are circulating. I don't know that there are answers right now, but the notion of that we are needing to use data and all of its shapes and forms um, is really upon us. So basically, I'm here to say all of this that's being done at the national level really matters to us as an arts and cultural practitioner sphere here in Chicago and now uh, being more sophisticated, even more sophisticated thinkers about how we reflect on the work that everyone in this room is doing. Um, so that's my commentary. Um, quickly, my second approach is to actually look at some of the data that Sunil um, spoke about, actually uh, what it means for Chicago. So I'm going to look at the SPPA. Uh, Sunil mentioned that there are state level and metro analyses forthcoming, but basically at the Cultural Policy Center, if there's data out there, we can't resist diving into it. Um, so we'll just look at that briefly. And then um, Sunil mentioned that part of the BEA's work is to look at occupational um, counts and such. And so we'll look at um, an effort uh, forthcoming, or very soon forthcoming, about efforts here in Chicago and artists look like here. Uh, so this is just a tip of the iceberg, just briefly. Uh, what does the SPPA say about Illinois and Chicago? And by Chicago here, I'm talking about the um, core based statistical metropolitan area. So it reaches its, Chicago's the nexus, but it's really based on commuters. So it has a little bit of Wisconsin in there, a little bit of Indiana. So we know about the benchmark arts. The national narrative is that it's declining. That narrative continues for Illinois. On the left, I have Illinois for the years 2002, 2008, and 2012. On the right, I have the Chicago data solely for 2008 and 2012, um, purely because that's what we have consistent measure on for consistent geography, so we're gonna work from there. That in mind, we know that the, S the benchmark arts have been historically what people have known about the SPPA. That's kind of what first gets picked up in the media. There are other measures in the SPPA, and they have been asked consistently over time. So if you want to look at attendance on a broader level and a broader definition, unfortunately, we can do that. Unfortunately, the narrative remains the same. It's been in decline over these years for the state as well as um, in, in Chicago. So looking at these general categories of attendance that Sunil showed us earlier, the, the top bar there is the national percentage for attending movies, and then the second set there for attending visual arts, the bottom set there for attending live performing arts. And then the, uh, red, the darkest red bar is uh, Illinois, the kind of the pink is Chicago. And overall, there's not outrageous differences, but there are two points I want to draw your attention to. Here, the difference with attending movies. People in Chicago are attending movies at um, relatively high rates compared to the US on, the, on average. There's also a difference here in terms of the rate at which they're attending visual arts. The rate for Chicago is actually lower than what it is for the US on average. With that in mind, look more closely at kind of what are these different measures that comprise attending visual arts. There are three main measures that go into this, visiting an art museum or gallery, going to a visual art or craft fair or festival, and visiting a historic park or monument. And this has been, these questions have been asked consistently over time. And the narrative remains the same, that these, they're declining, and these are some of the highest rates for attendance overall. So for example, they also, um, the SPPA includes measures about attending opera, attending ballet, attending other forms, but the visual arts tend to be the highest rates overall, and they've been declining over these years. Um, additionally, as an anecdote, in our quick analysis, we do not see anything increasing, and everything else 
is pretty much remaining the same, except with one additional decline, which is the measure for attendance at live musical stage plays. Um, in Chicago in 08, it was approximately 23% and declined to 13% in the 2012 data. One other, I'm not going to go into all the different modes that Sunil talked about, I'm just pointing out differences to the national numbers. And one other thing that really stood out is kind of what are people accessing when they're using mobile, mobile devices? And pretty much Chicago and Illinois measures the same rates nationally with one exception, and that is the rate at which they're accessing visual art such as painting, sculpture, and design through a mobile device. And, and Chicago is doing that about half the rate of the um, US on average. Art making and art learning. There are a few other things that I'm just pointing out that Chicago's falling a little bit lower than US on average. We're a little bit lower in uh, creating leatherwork, metalwork, woodwork, in singing, in performing or practicing dance of any kind, as in taking lessons. It was 7% of the US as a whole have taken a lesson in the past 12 months. But it's not all. I mean, there are lots of questions about, are these, these right questions to be asking? Certainly, you can go into more detail about, should we compare ourselves to um, a Midwest region as opposed to the US? But these are just numbers to get a, to kind of um, whet your appetite for what's forthcoming in the NEA report. But finally, let's talk about social dancing, which is kind of the big headline. And I'm not a, a P. So we said it's 32% in the US. Um, people who live in the Chicago market like to dance. So our the rate here is 42% of people reported that they've done a social dance in the past 12 months. So that is kind of the, the big number where we're a statistically different from the US on average. So that is a very brief whirlwind of just how is this data meaningful to us here locally. And I just want to dive quickly into some work we uh, are about to release about uh, one component being artist employment. Uh, we're releasing a report next week called Measuring Chicago's Artistically Creative Economy. Uh, thank you to the Chicago Community <coughs> Trust and Arts Alliance for seed funding for this project. Um, and while there's national and international data that's largely been used to form the BEA work at the national level, we tried to parse this apart. What data is actually available to look at this in a very local geography? And so utilizing the American Community Survey, another federal um, data set publicly available, they have estimates over five years. That's a longer time span, but you can dive into a much more granular uh, geographic proximity to look at some of your statistics. So. The BEA work um, covered, it's a much larger umbrella about artistic and creative and cultural workers and they have online kind of all those definitions and there are questions in the field about kind of what's meaningfully nationally versus kind of what's meaningful um, to a local market. We very much uh, with the D cases work, culinary arts is something that's very much valued here but not necessarily in other markets. So because we were taking a comparative approach with geographies, we decided to go with the NEA's list of artist occupations, which I'll turn to Sunil later on to ask if this remains or how that thinking on this is evolving. But it's 11 occupations that use a standard occupation codes. Actors, announcers, architects, fine artists, designers, musicians, photographers, producers, directors, writers, and authors. I'm just gonna give you a quick snippet of some of the things that we saw from a comparative perspective. Uh, we looked at, ooh, 11 uh, cities overall, um, just really is what's the portion of individuals working in these occupations. So these are employed artists, not solely artists overall. Um, Chicago's 2.2% of our labor force, and the national um, percentage is 1.35. So you, if you look at the rates, mm -hmm. there's Chicago right in the middle. This is by west going to east, going from left to right. Our location quotient, looking at kind of the density, we have 1.6 times the national rate of artists employed here in Chicago. You see on the far left, uh, San Francisco has a, a larger density, approximately 3.18, but Chicago has quite a substantial uh, density of artists, employed artists. Very briefly, what you can do with the American Community Survey data is just look at where are these artists working generally by sector. We know that artists, largely compared to other occupations, etc., has a very substantial portion of self-employed, approximately a third, and that's also reflected in national data. Here in Chicago, 57% are in for-profit entities, 10% nonprofit, 2% government. 
And so now prepare yourselves. This is a very small chart that I'll just walk through. But this is for each occupation is um, on the x-axis. We try to show by color here kind of what sector, um, what's the distribution of those occupations across the sectors that I just described. So I'm just going to point a few things out. So here we see this is for profit, the largest portions of announcers, architects, designers, um, and producers and directors, as well as kind of other entertainers, which is a little bit of elusive, a catch-all. The largest portion of those uh, of people working in that occupation work in the for-profit sector. Uh, we see that musicians and photographers, the largest portion of those occupations, work in self-employed. Much more of a project-based, getting gigs kind of occupation. Now, we see here there is one category that talks about working without pay, and we see the largest portion of, the, of dancers are working uh, without pay compared to any other occupations. Um, and perhaps that's also why earlier we saw uh, the low rate of people performing or practicing dance in Chicago compared to the national numbers. Who knows? But that is my quick advertisement for why national efforts matter uh, to... Um, the arts and cultural sector here in Chicago in a local practice, looking at both systematic data and, and efforts, as well as looking more about how organizations can be more data-driven. And we'll move to questions. Any takers? Uh, one one dir pretty direct follow-up on themes in both of your papers is where and why, why are different components of activities increasing or decreasing? And how might one compare, say, to Chicago nationally, Illinois, and, and over time? Um, something I've looked at a little bit is, is, the, is the survey called the World Values Survey. It's done at the University of Michigan and then in about 100 countries, led by Ronald Inglehart and a bunch, bunch of others. It's, it, it's, it's one of the two largest international citizen surveys ever, really, or that is consistent, consistently asked over time. The, the, other, the other is the ISSP, and so these are the two major consistent overtime surveys, a lot like the SSSP focusing specifically on the arts. They, they have one item on the arts, which is their best con consistent item, which is how, how much do you participate in, how much are, they, it's not a participation right, per right. se, it's a membership. Right? They do have participation, right. but their longest mark over here and over time item is, is organizational membership in arts and cultural activities. And the striking thing is that there's a doubling, an increase, 200% over about 20 years in the U.S. It's about 300% in the Netherlands it's, it's a bit smaller in, say, in Scandinavia, Korea, and so forth, but it's still positive. It may be, you know, yep. 50, 70, 50, 70. Canada is about the same, just a little bit lower yeah. than the U.S. So the interesting question is, why the disparity between this, this big growth and, 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 what, and what you have when you go more nitty-gritty occupation and, and, and so forth? And, and I don't have a good, a, good, a good answer, except as I try to look at what, 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 you, what you are asking, but just as, as when you came to Chicago last time, you brought back dance, I guess I'm suggesting there is more there, yeah. especially when we, when we see Chicago's going down. And, and, may, and that, that is, so, just maybe to take one, as Jennifer's a dancer, why ask social dancing? Why not ask dancing? That is, maybe people dance alone or with their mother watching in their, in their dining room, and they don't count that. Or, or right. a second example, sometimes called underground. I just did a paper on underground clubs and so forth in Chicago, and there are about 70 of them underground. Sure. They're on the, on the internet. There's 70 of them that are measured. She analyzed how far they were from public transit and, and things of that sort. But one thing that is they, they don't have visibly reported tax revenues. They don't get permits mm -hmm. from, from the city. They're not, they don't, they, 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 they probably charge, but they're, they're basically losing money. They're, they're, right. and, then, and then others are basically pr parties, private parties people have, maybe, maybe 50, maybe 200 people, but they may have dancing and they may have various kinds of artistic performances done ostensibly in private settings. But I have friends who, I have students, friends and so forth, who, who've been 
who, been, who were active in these. And so this is where there is growth that, I'm act, that people say, I'm very active in these. And students say, I go to these because these are, these are offbeat, they're more, they're more interesting. I have, there's one student in the Harris School, as a woman who's created four bands, I believe, and, she, and two of them refuse to go to active booking regular commercial establishments because they want to write, they want to write mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. participate in a different kind of music. So there is innovation, it is active, and it would be legitimately reported if you say, do you do anything? Right. But it would, it would not fall into, in, into, the, into perhaps some of this. So I'm suggesting at least it's, it, it might be a, a, a sub-project to pursue uh, because it because it's I mean it's close it's in, in, and well I should say I applaud enormously what you have transformed that is for decades you you, you told you your reports and Paul DiMaggio and other basically told the same declining story but there's been an explosion of new creative interesting work and in that spirit I'm saying yeah absolutely hey, here's a little more and, and I would say it's more than a sub project it's actually the core of why we do this and so this is great input and I'm going to take back and look at that survey I wasn't aware of that particular Michigan survey um, so one of the things part of the issue is is the framing of the questions I mean this really comes down to you know survey is kind of like real estate you can only ask a certain number of things and you get this your coveted you know slot in the census for example which is booked like four years out apparently like all their supplemental surveys are booked like other agencies have already piggybacked on those surveys um, we really tried to through test various tests and pilots and everything come up with this distinction so for example with dancing I remember um, we tried to do an open-ended dancing and some of the response if I remember correctly was people were in their mind like it's kind of like when you ask people do you do arts and craft or something they think well that's not really I sew but that's is that arts and craft? I'm sewing something for myself it's not it's not necessarily a utilitarian thing I you know I consider it but it, they don't consider it art so there's 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 framings of the question which I know that this, the question wording was tested to have a sort of to, we had to almost call out the social factor in that particular question um, but I hear you in general, and for example, for singing, we have a question which Jennifer reported it on where we, I forgot the phrasing, but it's, it's very simple. It's, do you sing at all? You know, it's, it could be anything, you know. Uh, you could sing in the shower, I guess, you know. So we perhaps should take a look at doing something like that for a dance, and we'll, I'll make a note of that so we go back and see if there was a reason why we split it up. But in general, um, I think the stuff you're talking about, the underground clubs and all that, that's very much what we want to capture, and that's the difficulty with trend analysis is that we can do it for a year, like 2012, I feel we busted this thing open and we asked all kinds of questions that we didn't even report here. But the problem is we only know that for that year and because we never had asked it before, so we're setting a new baseline. Um, so going forward, hopefully we've engineered the survey in a way that we will be able to get those kinds of participation because now we do ask about um, really irrespective of setting, it doesn't have much to do with whether it was in a club or at a party, but did you do that activity? So for example, the person who had four bands would show up in our arts creation palette, which is much broader. I always have to bring an arts analogy. To it. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I just wanted to comment on, we are in the early days of what we're learning from the California Survey of Arts and Cultural Participation that is, is currently underway. Um, but I spoke about this publicly last week, so I assume it's fair game today. But when the key, th we had much more liberty in terms of the actual survey and questionnaire design than what um, you are beholden to as a federal agency. So we, um, and we use that to try to learn how do you ask, how do you best ask questions to elicit the array of activities that people are involved in? Because there is a, a cognitive hurdle, certainly what, what do people, what do different communities consider arts and culture, um, I have a number of students in the room who actually did a, a project this past quarter. They're nodding their heads and they know what that is about. Um, what's meaningful to different communities may not be to others. But, so it's, it's, but moving beyond that, assuming that there's some set of activities, how do you help people respond and consider that to be arts and culture when you're asking it in a survey? Our questionnaire open, uh, started with an open-ended question about people do lots of things that are related to arts and culture. Tell us what you do. That was pretty much it. There's a few uh, wording tweaks here and there, and it was amazing what we got. Um, not all of which was PG-13, um, but some was about uh, taking make personalized bow ties, um, all sorts of forms of dance, cooking, a broad array. And then we drilled down and tried to ask questions about the form of the art, just music, dance, generally. Do you do something with it? If you tell us yes, then we'll dive down. So we were able to say, do you sing? 
shower, formally, whatever it was, let us know. And then we tried to parse out, That's do good. you do it very casually or do you actually um, practice, trying to make it some distinction, have some indication about formality, as well as level of commitment in terms of time or frequency with which you do it. Um, we had a little more room and we took some liberty with that. So we're learning how to ask these questions. But we and can I'll be benefit from that. So we can't ask, like our census requirements, like they, we can't ask any open-ended questions right. where, you know, fill in the blank for this. But uh, we have a better taxonomy which emerges from these kinds of studies and we can apply that to the study. Um, so for example, a lot of the questions about creation, we ask, did you sing? And then they say, yes, we have drilling down. We, we then ask, okay, so did you put your music on, you know, on the web or whatever the questions are that follow up. Um, so we can do, do a similar approach, I think, with yeah. some of those. And, and, and so we're learning very much. This project had to ask questions and we'll be sharing more with Sunil uh, as we learn more. Yeah, the other thing is, I mean, this is kind of the sobering, so on the one hand it's great because we're getting a very expansive, I used expansionist before the term, but getting a very broader array of things that somebody's going to check yes to. But those individual percentages, I don't know if you agree, are really, really low. And then we have to be aware of that. So even, I hate to say it, but if you ask someone, did you dance social dancing, and if you ask separately about the other kind, if you merge those two, it's still maybe one percentage point that you've gained by doing that. And so one of the things we did in reporting today, like how do you make 2% rel relevant when you're talking about a very specific art form, is you aggregate and you say, did you do any of these things? And what are the, five, and I think that modal analysis that you helped to do, Jennifer, was useful because it gives people five distinct ways that each have pretty large numbers. You know, it's like, you know, 30%, 40%, do one of those five. And then, you know, then you can drill down and get at all this really interesting stuff. But if you want to know about the general population, that's your remit to look at the U.S. population as a whole. You know, when we go to OMB and others and talk about our data, you know, they really want to see the big numbers to know who's doing what, who's not doing what. And we have to kind of aggregate to kind of tell a story. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I have a question about survey design, I think. <laughs> Let me try to process as I speak. So I, uh, I work for an arts organization in town and I am a grant writer, so I have to report to funders on the findings that we have from projects that we, um, that we undertake at the organization. And the funders are interested in learning about the audiences who are participating in our programs. Um, I've encountered resistance at the artistic level in terms of surveying members of the audience because they don't want a survey to, to have the experience become transactional or to somehow diminish a participant's artistic experience in the project. And I was wondering if you could respond to that argument for one thing, and my initial response when I was, um, when I encountered that resistance was, um, is there a way to create uh, a method of surveying that actually enhances an audience member's experience of a project as opposed to taking away from it? And, you know, can you kind of, if, if you, have a sense of that, could you elaborate on that? Would you want to go first? Uh, sure, well, just kind of two things I want to touch on there. I think my commentary piece speaks to what you're bringing up about some of the tension between artistic staff um, and, and your job of trying to report to funders or develop appropriate measures, get re reliable data, and make sense of the information that you're gathering. And I think that's part of the organization, the arts and cultural organization change that that's being called upon or that's necessary. How to bridge that internally and then also how to make sense of whatever data you might capture. But there are lots of examples out there and we can talk about it later of people using lots, mostly it's technology based, about how to interact with the, the performance or other aspects of the setting to capture data about the experience. So there's lots of stuff happening. Um, it takes some careful uh, development, but uh, there's lots of ways to capture data that enhances the experience. Yeah, and I actually think that um, one way to, I don't know if this kind of answers your question, but you can certainly do blinded surveys of, now I'm, trying to, I'm thinking of it more where you have several organizations of a certain kind of art form. So for example, the theater communications group 
does uh, studies, sort of benchmarking studies. We've been using the word benchmark a lot. But, you know, where, they, where the theaters all give their data and their participation data and so forth, attendance, but, you know, it's not like they're, you don't see whose data it is, uh, but you're able to know that, you know, this is a certain budget size of the theater. And so here's how these organizations of this size are doing relative to other groups. And so you, you can come up with categories. I think it's harder for a specific arts organization. One, if you're just doing it for one arts organization, how do you convince your funders and your, uh, you know, that, that you're, what you're doing is going to benefit the organization itself? Um, we've engaged in a lot of work on what we call audience affect or audience impact, um, where we're, we're piloting some work to understand how people who engage in NEA-funded live <laughs> performances or exhibits or film fa film uh, exhibits for example too um, what they what they experience coming out of it and what do we mean by that well there's a lot of interesting research I pointed to the subjective well-being field that's because they've come up with really interesting questionnaires uh, and models for thinking through uh, the intensity of things you know so you can think about it as a much more I think authentic <laughs> approach perhaps to a customer satisfaction survey like did you like this or not you know it's, it, that's kind of where we're, we're understanding the tastes vary, they're different uh, places people are starting from when they engage with the work, uh, but we're trying to get at the intent, what we're uh, sort of like uh, the concept of flow in, in positive psychology, we're losing track of time in the moment. Uh, the, the kinds of emotions people register from a checklist, those kinds of things which don't speak so much to maybe the hard decisions about does that performance do well or is it good for a bottom line, but they speak to uh, what we believe the arts are to some extent contributing toward in a person's personal experience of, of something. Hey, thanks for coming and presenting. I, I find it very interesting. I'm not sure this is the right form for this question, but I'll try to frame it so that it is. Um, from, from, a, uh, from a mission standpoint uh, for the NEA, uh, is there a concern when you're including, from, from you're taking a bird's eye view of what the arts are, when you're including movies, when you're including, uh, you know, your phone, when you're including all these things, is there a concern from a mission standpoint that uh, it's not capturing perhaps uh, what might be needed for federal funding or what might be needed? Um, and, and in that sense, is it, is it, could it be missing what that individual, what we were just referring to, the individual impact, the community, while being, uh, does it perhaps muddy the waters as far as uh, what the NEA is trying to do, you know, as far as the nonprofit versus mm -hmm. the for-profit mm -hmm. or the nonprofit versus all those other? Yeah, that's a fantastic, really good question. Uh, so, a very practical one. So we actually, um, I think the, the one of the things that the previous chairman really emphasized about the NEA, if you notice our logo is, is Artworks. So the idea is that uh, he would put it in three simple ways. Artworks, uh, in this visceral way we're talking about, with affect or whatever you want to call it, the personal experience of the arts, which is sometimes referred to as the intrinsic versus instrumental impact. It works economically, it works, literally it works in the labor force. He talks about, he used to talk about that a lot, and, and that essentially was the framework for our strategic plan and a lot of even, of even the research emphasis. So what I mean by that is we've believed it's not enough to capture only a particular area of the arts, a, a corridor of the arts. Uh, we really are trying to understand it in its totality as a society, and so that necessarily is going to be inclusive of more than the not-for-profit sector. Um, but hopefully, it will also generate even more impetus and uh, rationale for those nonprofit organizations to do their work effectively and to give them information they can use and share. Um, so we, we recognize that, of course, you know, we're funded as, you know, to fund not pro nonprofits, uh, and in some cases, very rare cases, individuals, like through writing fellowships. But, you know, primarily we fund nonprofits, and of course, 40% of our money goes to the states who have their own sub-granting programs. Um, but we, we believe that for us, as a, even if you're just working in the nonprofit space, you want to know how you're sitting relative to your sphere of endeavor, which arguably is beyond a particular uh, kind of establishment. You know? I mean, so in other words, I do think the, the data on, for example, movies, video games, in fact, these lines, as you know, are blurring, so nonprofits are doing much of that work now in ways that are very innovative and even startup-like. So, for example, um, you know, in the last couple of years, the NEA has been funding video game design, 
Uh, who would have thought they would do that? And it's because people at the media arts level as experts who've previously evaluated only not-for-profit uh, media arts uh, applications have all agree, have tended to agree that this is a rising form of art that we don't want to lose, let slip away from the nonprofit sector, and we want to really make sure we're attending to it like another art form. So that's the kind of thing that we're seeing more of the, uh, the NEA kind of, I think, thinking big in that, from that sense. And, but what I want to make sure we do nail and, and, and also then is to, clo is to close that loop and make sure that we are still providing information that are lessons to the core base, our grantees and applicants who are going to be from the nonprofit sector. I should just add that one of the things that's been exciting working at the NEA the last few years since we launched this grants program is we now have many more academic partners than we ever did. I mean, well, I, should, I don't know if we ever, if I can't speak historically for the NEA, but certainly having, coming here and, you know, students and postgrads and, you know, faculty who were engaged in these kinds of topics, um, you know, and they're a nonprofit. They're, you know, technically nonprofit, but you would argue, you know, arguably academia is its own kind of sector. And I think we're starting to see a lot of crossover with that sector, too. You talked about second order benefits and the societal and, and human development and economic benefits. If we work back from those, if they are the real sort of point, then we work back from those to ask what other forms of activity lead to those desired benefits and mm -hmm. in impacts. Um, we get a sphere much larger than the arts. Yes. You've used this phrase, both of you use the phrase arts and culture. Are we in the middle of an evolution from thinking of this as the arts, uh, as the sort of primary category that then um, leads us to justify it by reference to certain outcomes? Or are we now flipping that historically and saying, we're looking at those outcomes as a society mm -hmm. and the arts and yet many other things, from the sciences to mm -hmm. cooking and some of the many other sort of um, tangential activities that you mentioned are really the sort of right. drivers? Want to go first? Do you have any thoughts? Based on my recent work, I think yes, because it's going to been kind of a historical trend of kind of what's been considered high arts. And in interviewing, um, my students worked with an immigrant group um, recently, um, as well as qualitative work that I've been doing in preparation for th um, the survey. If you go to individuals and you ask about what do you do that involves arts or aesthetics or culture, it's very broad what they'll give you. And it's meaningful to them. And it has something to do with artistic creation. And so how people define arts for themselves is very different than how we as a nonprofit sphere have been defining it for a long time. And I hear many, many more conversations as of late of talking about putting the individual back at the center of arts conversations at large. And it's many shapes, forms, varieties, um, communities of, that value certain aesthetics versus may not be valuable in others. Um, and putting that at the center. And then certainly the arts profit sphere is it important aspect of that, but it's much bigger and broader than a defined sector that, we've, that we all love and cherish and are trying to understand how it can connect um, in improved ways to what our reality is today and how people are defining arts for themselves. So um, the NEA has the arts in its name, and that's, that's really embedded in every, you know, in our legislative statute, all the way down to our strategic planning and the way we dis award, you know, make decisions on grant awards. So there's that one level, which is where we, as an organization, are trying to be the most effective in serving the public through the arts. But that said, we should never lose sight that those Im outcomes are sovereign and they have their own uh, value. I mean, they, they have their own many, many contributing factors of which arts are maybe just one, and we know, are just one piece. In some cases, there's some unique benefits, mm -hmm. perhaps, that we, we have, don't even have on that map that come out of the arts. We'd like to know what those are. But we have said these are outcomes that we believe as a society are worth tracking, irrespective of whether it's the arts, but we are going to track the arts piece of that. And so that's our kind of connection. Um, but the thing I want to point out is, you know, government agencies are realizing that this is very sticky. And so when you, you know, the, the whole word human development, I mean, it's like, what is, that's such a gigantic, that's everything, right? But what it, it's meant to convey is a person-centric view toward programming and research and all that stuff. So what that means is being aware that people are in a system, so to speak. And so, uh, you know, when you talk about out of school, in, in school, you know, after, uh, 
you know, uh, the blur between, um, you know, uh, for example, in healthcare, they talk about treating the whole patient rather than, you know, understanding the whole cycle of regimens that patient undergoes and how they correspond with each other and what the experiences were. You know, people are, you know, the health community is generally now much more interested in cultural, culture with a broad brush, culture in the sense of anthropological culture uh, of, of patients. You know, they want to know case histories. They want to know a lot more about what enriches uh, that person's lives so, and what, what contributes to their complaints and so forth. So we're, we're recognizing it's a very com complex and exciting time. Um, and in that sphere, we're trying to just say, let's try to um, make sure that we understand how the arts threads itself through that. And so um, one thing I just want to highlight real quick, um, uh, there's a colleague of mine, Bill O'Brien, who does some really great work with the military, uh, the Department of Defense, and um, uh, the Walter Reed National Medical Military Center there in Bethesda. And they're looking at, for example, how the arts contribute to patient, improved patient outcomes. Uh, in these are wounded warriors who come back with uh, really the invisible wounds of war, let's say. Uh, you know, traumatic brain injury, psychological illnesses, and they're very refractory patients, like hard to treat through various other methods. And they seem to be responding through to music, neurologic music therapy, to um, to uh, you know, mask making, to uh, expressive writing, and uh, it's interesting. Is Bill would be the my colleague Bill would be the first to say it's not the arts that's doing it only, and it's it's clearly the fact that you have these a supportive community with various other therapies working in tandem, complementary in a complementary way, and so that's just one example. But I try to think of that because it applies to so many things about the arts where we shouldn't fool ourselves that it's the only thing out there. But then on the other hand, it, it's not getting enough. Uh, credit, I think, for a lot of the things that it's doing. I can't believe I just used the arts as a, pers I personified the arts just now. <laughs> one more, one more. Um, I'd love to hear about any work you've done putting the SPPA data set against maybe other data sets, mm -hmm. asking questions, for example, is there a correlation between the number of cultural organizations per capita and, say, arts participation. Yeah, so I can actually send you some reports we've done on that. Um, and it is interesting because there has been a growth in uh, nonprofit organizations over time uh, and in general and in arts and cultural. Um, and so actually I thought of that in relation to what was raised about membership. I don't know if that's just a parallel phenomenon or the degree to which membership is direct participation, you know, I don't know, but there has been a growth in the nonprofit sector in arts and culture, which has seemed to be, when you just think about those two points, that decline in these certain activities and a growth in nonprofit, and you, then you see the disconnect, and you, but I think there's, a, there's clearly a much more complex story there, as you've seen, hopefully, through some of these other forms of participation, but we can report those, we can give you those numbers to show you the per capita growth, where we can track that at a mm -hmm. geographic level. And we've tried to do that. Some people have done some great work. Uh, Ann Markison, I think, did a study in California mm -hmm. looking yes, at that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's sometimes easier to do on the regional level, but I can, I, we can definitely talk about that if you'd like. And um, did I answer that? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you.